Well, good morning, family. All right, y'all know what I say. Talk back. Good morning, family. Good morning. It's good to uh, see you all. Um, you know, by way of uh, introductory comments, I was going to double down on uh, you all attending the ministry fair, but then Cindy did it for me. So I don't know that I can say it any better um, than she did. Uh, but I want to encourage you all that um, we want this house not just to be a house um, of consumers, uh, but a house of contributors. That it's not that we just come to receive uh, and to be served, but that uh, we as people also come to give and to serve. So I want to encourage you to uh, swing on by. We got your food. Uh, I'll slip on by uh, right after service upstairs to the cafeteria and learn the different ways that you uh, can serve. And I'll, I'll be real blunt. Ready? We need your help. Is that okay for me to say? We, we need help. Uh, uh, I'll, you know, we'll just talk for a second. Um, our church... Um, uh, in December of last year was averaging right around 54 people. Okay, that's 54 um, everybody. Okay, that's uh, adults and kids all together on a Sunday. Um, and uh, as of uh, last Sunday, we're right around 130. Okay, so God, praise God. Amen. God is growing the house. Um, but that also means our church has doubled in less than a year. Um, and with uh, that, that growth and all that God has uh, blessed us with, um, there's more of you all to serve. Uh, and we believe that by God's grace, we will continue to grow. Amen, fam? Um, and we want to make sure that whoever God brings through our doors, uh, that they know that we have prepared for them. Um, I love what Cindy said about um, watching Billy Graham when she was 10 and receiving the Lord. Uh, somebody had to make that happen. Um, somebody had to contribute to get him on TV or whatever the thing was. And uh, likewise, if you have enjoyed uh, being with us uh, as a people, um, somebody has to make this happen. Amen, fam? And so please, uh, please, please, please uh, hang out after church right upstairs in the cafeteria. You'll hear all the different ministries and ways to serve here at Victory. Amen? Amen, amen. Um, the second uh, announcement that I want to double down on uh, is our ENC conference. Our interest meeting is coming up. Uh, all college students in the, in the, in the church, wave, wave at me real quick, all of our college students. All right, now look, this is for y'all, okay? <laughs> this is for you all. Uh, so um, we are taking our college students down to Orlando, Florida, uh, January 2nd to the 4th, and I uh, want to uh, get all those who are interested together. So if you're interested uh, to coming to the interest meeting, uh, you can sign up uh, uh, by uh, uh, scanning that QR code and let us know that you'll be there. So that way we don't run out of pizza because y'all eat a lot. Okay? Uh, so uh, please, uh, all of our college students, please make sure that you come on out for our interest meeting on the 15th. All right. I believe those are all my pre-sermon announcements. Boom. My timer started. Tiffany, don't you worry, girl. Okay? All right. <laughs> um, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this house, God. We praise you, Lord, for your power and your presence, Lord, already felt in this place. Um, Jesus, 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 we need you. Lord, I pray that we never come in here as professionals, God, but, Lord, we're all practitioners, Lord, practicing your presence, practicing your power, God, practicing being with you. So, Lord, I pray, um, Lord, that uh, you would meet us in our vulnerability, God. You would meet us in our in our weakness, God, in our, our feebleness, God, that you would you would come, Lord, and where we are weak, God, you would be strong. God, I pray that you would bless this moment, bless this message, God, as always. Let these be the last words that I speak, and now, Spirit of God, you speak. Lord, my words will not change anyone, but yours will. They're the only ones that have ever done. I haven't done that. It's changed. It's changed people. So, Lord, I pray that you would speak to your people. Do it only you can do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, fam, well, uh, we're still in the same sermon series, baby. <laughs> we have been, I didn't know how to get the on-ramp going. I was just like, well, it's the same one. All right. Uh, we have been in the same sermon series called... For the culture since February of this year, okay? 
Um, and uh, we are endeavoring to answer the question, uh, who are we? Uh, you'll notice that there were uh, three different movements uh, to the sermon series. Uh, the first, we talked about kingdom. What does it mean for us to be Christians? We covered uh, the foundational themes of Christianity. Uh, we talked about salvation and lordship, repentance and baptism in the water and baptism in the spirit. We talked about um, devotion. We talked about discipleship. And we talked about the church. Uh, so we covered all those principles. And then we talked about our covering. Uh, we are a local church that uh, reaches globally. Uh, we are a part of a family of, cha of campus ministers ministries and churches called Every Nation, Every Nation. Uh, and uh, Every Nation exists to honor God by establishing Christ-centered, Spirit-empowered, spirit and socially responsible churches and campus ministries in very good. Uh, and so we covered what that was, or what that meant for us to be a church that meets locally and reaches globally. And then uh, we moved on to talk about what does it mean to be a part of Victory Church of Charlottesville. Uh, what does it mean for us to be a part of this local body here? We've talked about um, our vision. Uh, Victory uh, Church exists to see people reconciled to God and to each other. And now we are moving on to our mission. It's a four-word mission. Uh, it is... Oh, I was going to make them guess. Okay, right. We'll just do it. Uh, <laughs> demonstrate, deliver, disciple, deploy. Amen, fam? Our, our vision is what we want to see. Our mission is how we're going to see it. And um, uh, we've been covering our, 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 our mission statement. I talked about uh, demonstrate, and that is defined as uh, this. We will demonstrate the victory and reconciliation that God has wrought in our lives. That's the first thing that we're going to do. The second thing is we're going to deliver. We will deliver those bound to the same victory and reconciliation that we now walk in. The third thing is that we will disciple. We will disciple people in this newfound life of victory and reconciliation with, with grace and without judgment. And the fourth thing is we will deploy. We will deploy victorious and reconciled people uh, to demonstrate, deliver, disciple, and deploy others. Amen, fam? So we've covered the, the first two. We've covered demonstrate. We've covered deliver. So what's the name of the message today? Disciple. Disciple. Boy, y'all sharp today, baby. Let's go. All right. So today we are talking about disciple. 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 Now, uh, disciple, uh, discipleship implies that we are training people, that we are, that we are helping them grow. Um, and uh, by way of, of, of this message, when we say uh, disciple, we are saying that we are going to help people grow in this newfound life of victory and reconciliation with grace and without judgment. That's what we want to do. Amen? We want to help people grow. Everybody all right with that? We want to help people grow. In other words, how you came in today should be different than how you come in in six months from now. Okay? So we want to help people grow. Now, that is difficult enough. Helping people grow. That's already a difficult task. That's already, that's already hard enough. But then the Lord gave us this caveat. We have to help people grow in this newfound life of victory and reconciliation with grace and without judgment. See, that's where it gets sticky, okay? And I think about, listen, when I think about my children, I can help them grow. I can help them, you know, I, I feed them, right? They eat, they grow. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When I just said that, I looked down, and my daughter's snacks is still sitting on this floor, okay? So I was like, who left that goldfish? I was with my child. All right, so so look, I feed them clearly. Right? They had a little snacks this morning, okay? They, they, I feed them, and they grow. Now, here's here, the, you see the test of the message right now. I got to do it with grace and without judgment. So I had to tell my daughter, hey, sweetheart, when you're, eating your snacks in the morning. Maybe we don't leave those sitting in the sanctuary, right? And without judgment, I can't judge her for leaving the snack. I'm living the message right now. I didn't even, like I looked out, I was like, she did that. <laughs> so we have to help them grow with grace and without judgment. Now in order for that to happen, we're going to need God. We're going to need the Spirit of God for all of it. Are we there? Three things that I want to point out about this concept, this principle of discipling someone. Three things that I believe that we're going to need in order to help people grow. Are we in the room? Three things. Number one, patience. Oh, y'all, okay. All right, good. Okay. We had a solid moan of agreement. Very good. Very good. 
Patience, okay? So, all right. Boom. All right, so that's the first one, okay? The second thing that I want to talk about this concept in discipleship is proximity. Proximity. All right, we got two modes of agreement. I think we're doing, look, Naomi, we're doing all right, sis, all right? All right, patience, proximity, and perspective. Patience, proximity, and perspective. If we are going to be a church that disciples, we are going to need patience, we're going to need proximity, and we're going to need perspective. You ready to rock this morning? All right, let's get it. I'm not coming from a main text. I'm coming from three different stories that are in Scripture, but I think you'll be able to follow me. To illustrate this concept of patience, I want to talk about my guy, Peter. Y'all remember him? Uh, Peter, uh, if, we, if we look at Peter, let's look at when Jesus first met him. Okay? Matthew 4, uh, 18 through 20. Matthew 4, 18 through 20, talking about Peter. Okay? Uh, point number one, you need patience. All right? Matthew 4, 18 through 20. Here we go. While well, walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net to the sea, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, and he said to them, this is Jesus talking, or this is Jesus, yeah. He says to them, follow me, and here's what I'm going to do. I will make you fishers of men. So Jesus says, I'm going to change you from fishermen to fishers of men. Are we tracking? All right? And verse 20 says this. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Now, that's powerful. Now, if only discipleship was that simple. That's, that's brilliant, right? Boom. Jesus comes. Hey, quit your job. Follow me. What they do? Quit their job and follow him. Sounds good. And then look what happens all the way at the end of their story. Let's look at Let's look at when Peter, on the day of Pentecost, right, is going to preach his first sermon, okay? Uh, Jesus has uh, uh, died. He's uh, uh, resurrected right now. He's ascended. Told him, stay in Jerusalem till you receive the promise, right? Everybody remember this little Sunday school lesson, all right? Stay in Jerusalem till you receive the promise, right? They're all in one room. Don't really know what they're waiting on, but they told, Jesus said, don't go nowhere. So I don't know if he's going to come back on Tuesday. I don't know what's going on, but we're going to be here together, right? All right, so they're in the room, right? They're praying all in one accord, right? Spirit of God falls, right? Uh, they begin uh, speaking in other languages, right? As the Spirit descended on all of them, it was so out of control that they spilled into the city, right? And then the people that were there for this, for this feast called Pentecost from all over the place were hearing the wonderful works of God in their own language, okay? And so they thought, this is what they thought. They thought the people were drunk, right? And so, so Peter had to stand up, right? And he was said, hey, this, these men are not drunk as you suppose, right? And he preaches the whole gospel, right? I remember day of Pentecost. All right, this is what happened at the end. At the end, after he does, after he does all this, right? It's a wild moment. Acts two, verse thirty-seven through forty-one. Now, when they had heard this, those who were listening, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, "Brothers, what shall we do?" Peter preaches this amazing message. What are we supposed to do? And Peter said to them, "Repent." And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. All right? He preaches the message. This is what you're supposed to do. Repent, and you're going to receive the Holy Ghost. Right? Verse 40, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And look what happened in verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, they did what he said, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. What Jesus had said, that I will transform you from a fisherman to a fisher of men, happened. It wasn't just a sermon he, sp he was spreading out over the people that day. It was a net he threw out over the people. And as he was preaching that message, the people got caught up into the net and, pull and pulled into the kingdom. He became a fisher of men. Beautiful. Isn't that wonderful? Wrapped in a ribbon, tied in a bow, baby. <laughs> Do you know how much time passed between that initial meeting with Jesus on the shore to this extremely great moment of Pentecost Sunday and him preaching? Three and a half years. 
give or take. Do you know what Peter was like in between those two moments? All my Bible people have read the Bible. But don't worry, I've got a summary. Let's look at Peter's greatest hits. This is, Jesus says, I'm going to make you a fisher of men, and this is what my guy does. Number one, he tried to stop Jesus from dying, right? Now, if you know the gospel, Jesus' death was a little bit intricate to this whole thing. So he tells Jesus, listen, Peter was amazing. He tells Jesus, Jesus said, hey, I'm telling you what's going to happen. All the things I must suffer, right, at the hands, right? And Peter, Peter corrects Jesus. Now, that wouldn't be the first, that wouldn't be the last time. This is what he did. He said, he said, uh, uh, Jesus, certainly not, right? And you know what Jesus responded to him? He said, get behind me and call me devil. <laughs> Peter, correcting Jesus, trying to prophesy his own death. And Peter was like, oh, you must have missed, you must have missed this one guy. <laughs> all right? Now, this was another favorite one of mine, all right? Jesus has this transfiguration moment, right, uh, uh, on the mountain of, of transfiguration. Uh, you follow? All right, so, huh, so he has this moment, right, where Jesus uh, exposes himself in his glory to Moses and Elijah. It's a wild moment, y'all, all right? Jesus on the mountain, right? Well, look, well, Peter was, <laughs> Peter was there, okay? All right, so Jesus has, 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 has exposed his, his, his full glory, and he's having a conversation with Elijah and Moses, who are... If you don't know the Bible, they were dead a long time before that, right? So this is like, you know, weird stuff happening, right? Okay, so you see Jesus, okay, well, that's him in his full glorified body, right? <laughs> so this is what, this is what Peter says. I probably, y'all got to read the text, I'll, I guess, summarize it. So Peter goes, <laughs> he, they're talking, okay? Dead prophets of Jesus, okay? This, I mean, this is, I mean, you know, maybe humble yourself. This is what Peter goes. He goes, it is good that I am here. <laughs> Peter's like, you know what? No, nah, you know, it's good that it's good that you know I belong in this moment, right? That's the first. I'm serious. They're talking. Peter's like, excuse me, I think I'll have a It is good that I'm here. It is good. It is good. Y'all gotta read the Bible. It's y'all, y'all not reading it right. It says that. It is good that I'm here. And this is what he says. He goes, uh, this is what we're gonna do, right? He's talking to the dead prophets and the savior. Okay? He says, uh, we're gonna build a temple uh uh, uh to worship. Uh, uh, all three of you, right? And Jesus like, hush. Like, like, Peter, okay? Interrupting heavenly conversations, Peter. All right, let's go, let's go to the next one. What else happened? All right, then he tried to stop Jesus. Jesus is here trying to wash the disciples' uh, uh, feet, demonstrate his humility, right? Peter, all right, so Peter, or Jesus comes, all right, he's like, I haven't washed the feet, right? And which was a lowly position in, in, in Jewish culture, right? Well, it still would be, I don't know. I don't know about foot washing today, but anyway, so so it was a lower position, right? So uh, so uh, so Peter says, Peter says, uh, no, nah, you can't you can't wash my feet, right? And uh, and and Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have no part of my kingdom, right? And this this he flipped so fast, y'all. This is what he said, oh well, Jesus, uh, 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 not my feet, my whole body, right? He doesn't ask Jesus to give him a bath. This is strange, right? This is like, no, y'all gotta read the Bible. It happened. This is not, I'm not, it's funny because the Bible, not because me, right? So look, then Jesus, Jesus goes, Jesus has to tell me you don't have to take a bath. It's a whole little exchange, right? This is pretty, the way he's going to make a fisher of men, all right? Let's look at the next thing. All right, then, then my guy at the guard. Y'all see, y'all remember this, right? So Jesus bring up his little inner circle, right? He said, okay, he tells, the, he tells the disciples, you stay back here. Right? He brings up Peter, James, John. Y'all come a little bit further. Then he goes a little bit further. The guard gets seven, right before he dies. Am I with me? Okay. So then, uh, 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 Jesus is praying. He gets interrupted by Peter Small. Right? And so he got to go back. He got to go back. He said, hey, 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 hey. Friends, wake up. Right? All right. So, then, so he wakes them up. Right? He go back to pray. Right? And then he come back. Right? That's why I said he fell asleep at a prayer meeting. Two times, okay. All right. So he go back and uh, and uh, and he w and and uh, and uh, and he sleep again. And he wake him up. And Peter, oh, I'm so sorry, Lord. He said, Never mind. They're here now. Like I mean, like <laughs> never mind. They didn't argue. They're not. Nah, they didn't came to get me now. Okay. Peter, are we there? All right. Well, I got any more? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let's keep the story going. Okay. So then 
Then they come and try to get Jesus. Now Peter, he now he's so sleepy, he's missing people, right? He over here swinging swords, right? Trying to cut somebody's head off and they only cut the ear off, right? Because he half sleep, right? So so now, so Jesus is wild, man. So like he tried to wake Peter up. They come in to kill him, right? Then Peter cut his the guy's ear off. Jesus is like, no, don't do that. Like then he picked the ear up, put it back on the man. It was a whole scene. This all happened, okay? And then, then after all of that. Then, when somebody asked, do you know him? They said, I ain't never met him. Oh, Peter said, no, I can't. I'm so sorry to this man. I don't know him. I am just, I can't call him. I just, Peter, then, I don't know that. No, no. What? Y'all, to turn Peter into the apostle that was going to preach the first sermon to form the church, it took patience. It took patience. God had to take his time with him. I wonder how many times we haven't allowed people to get close to God because our patience has run. I was I was uh, prepping this sermon, and uh, and my uh, kids. I was out of town uh, doing a thing for every nation, and my, uh, my and I got back in town last night, or last night, just afternoon. So my kids hadn't seen me right, and uh, and all that means is I was behind on the message right. So I got to get up, all right. So I'm over here trying to type a thing right. Here they here here come my beautiful thing right. She come in here, my little nine year old daddy. What you doing? Said well, talk. I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about disciples. What does that mean? Okay. Uh, what's this word? Well, Jesus. So it's patience. It's the word. It's the word. It's patience. And where's mommy? Because <laughs> you need to, you need to go to her. Because <laughs> daddy is trying to do the thing to talk to people about patience. I'm not trying to operate it in my self right now. <laughs> And I realized what a privilege it was to preach the sermon to my nine-year-old first before I came and preached it to you. And the beauty of having a nine-year-old snuggled up on the couch with her daddy as he explains the scriptures to her, and the power that that would be in her life, that patience, or my lack thereof, was about to happen. She's not in here to hear this. Patience. Patience. Let her hear this. I wonder how many times we would have kicked Peter out of the crew. And there's a whole a restoration moment after he denied Jesus, and it's a beautiful thing, right? Jesus accepts him from the garden uh, when he resurrected, right? He says, tell my disciples, and go get Peter too. He got a personal invitation to see the resurrected Savior after all of this. And we know it had a deep impact in his heart because look what he would say later, later in 2 Peter 3, 8 through 9. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved. This is Peter preach, or this is Peter's letter. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Peter says, the timetable that God has isn't the same timetable that we have. And this is what he was saying. That he said, because the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Peter said that. Peter said that because he knew that. He said, y'all are worried, the disciples, oh, y'all worried he hasn't come back? Oh, you were No, 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 no. He's slow because he doesn't want us to perish. And the same patience that he expressed in my life is the same patience that he wants to minister to this world. It clearly affected me, the patience and the kindness of God. Family, I want to tell you, the Lord's timetable progress may not be ours. It just may not be ours. 
I talked about this last week in, in, in the context of, of deliverance. But, family, what if, what if the rate that God wants to grow someone is slower than your rate of desire? What is, I mean, I mean, really wrestle with this. What is successful ministry? Is it when they, is it when they're, when they, when they, when they stop doing whatever they're, they're supposed to be doing in, in three months? What if it, what if it takes them six months? What if it takes nine months to be whole? Is God less of a healer? Is God less of a redeemer? Is he, is he less of a deliverer if it's not on my timetable? What if it takes 10 years for someone to be right? Do we have the patience to pace with what Jesus is writing and someone else is doing? We're instructed in, in Scripture about patience. We look at Colossians 3.12. It says this. One of the things that we're supposed to put on. It says, put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, Humility, meekness, what else is supposed to be in our work? Patience. Let me tell you, with my children, I have to put on patience. That's, if we keep the wardrobe analogy, that's not something that I'm regularly wearing. So I have to actively put on patience. I talked about the fact that we needed God to do this. Let me prove it to you in Galatians 5, 20, uh, 22. Uh, in verse 23, it says that the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Family, one of the things that we're going to need by the Spirit of God is for Him to impart something into us. This isn't a, I don't want to, I don't want to weigh you down. This isn't some sort of, of patience that I'm preaching about where you've just got to kind of, you know, you grind and, and, and grab and, and grit and bear. No, the patience that we're going to need to walk with people to wholeness is a patience that only the Spirit of God can give us. We need patience. We need patience. Fam, and, and may I just keep testifying about myself so I don't have to expose you. Fam, I don't like to do nothing to sweat. Okay? The leadership team knows. I don't like to do nothing. So. <laughs> you can't why y'all laugh. I didn't like it. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> no, but like, I'm serious. But by the time I wanted it, I wanted it two days ago. And giddy up. But what happens if I get to the thing without that? What happens if I grind my way to the product outside of the pace of it? I'll tell you what happens. Then I do. And what I do, you won't see. The change that you want to see, the lives of those God has called us to walk in, are you the architect of it? It's not. If we're not careful, we'll build something for God without God. Over there. All right, patience number one. Number two, proximity. <clears throat> proximity. Proximity. Now, uh, for this, I want to look at a, a different Bible story. Okay, so we're going to shift from Peter. Let's go to the Old Testament. Let's grab a principle from the story of Samuel. Uh, Samuel was a uh, was a miracle baby that uh, his his mom didn't think he could have, and so or that she could have. So what she did after Samuel was born, she dedicated him to the Lord, and by that I mean. Uh, she brought him to the temple and left him with priests. This is, a, uh, this is we, I, I'm giving this baby back to you, right? Uh, that she had prayed for this baby and granted this, uh, this child and I have uh, dedicated to him, or dedicated him to him. So Samuel was, um, was uh, being brought up in the temple by this, uh, this, this priest. His name was Eli, okay? Um, and, and, and Eli would, would mentor Samuel. Well, well one day, uh, Samuel began to, to hear something strange that he thought was Eli. Eli had some instruction for him. That's where our story will pick up. 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10. Now, <clears throat> the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Uh, there was no frequent vision. 
Verse 2, at that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun, had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not, gone, had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Okay, they're all in the temple. Those are different pieces, pieces of furniture in the temple. The temple's where they met God. Uh, uh, verse 4. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli. Listen to that. Verse 4 again. Then the Lord called Samuel. And he said, Here I am. And after the Lord called Samuel, Samuel ran to Eli. It said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, Eli, I did not, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Okay? Serving before the Lord, but he had not heard the audible voice of God. Verse 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli, finally, perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Eli was like, you know what? Eli, he was getting woken up, right? So now Eli's like, you know what? I think God might be doing something. Verse 9, therefore Eli said to him, okay, okay, this is what you do. Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and laid down in his place, and the Lord came now and stood. <laughs> he said, well, let, well, let me get him down. Lord comes down and stand. Well, he, listen, uh, Samuel, right? All right? Uh, uh, and the Lord came and stood, calling at, at, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. And the Lord would go on to, uh, to tell uh, Samuel uh, what the message was, which was bad news for Eli and his sons. But nonetheless, uh, so, so, so he, would, he would go and he would tell, and tell the message. Now, when I talk about this concept of, of discipleship, and part of it that we're going to need to develop as a, as a people is proximity. We're going to have to walk closely with God and close with each other. We're going to have to walk close with God and close with each other. Let's talk about this proximity to God. Now, in order for Eli to know that it was the voice of God speaking to Samuel, what had to happen to Eli prior to that? He had to have experienced what? The voice of God speaking to him. There had to be an intimacy with God that Eli had prior to him trying to raise Samuel up, and Samuel will become one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Before that could happen, Eli had to have a relationship with the Lord. There had to be close proximity to God. Can I tell you, fam, that some of us will be drained in our discipleship efforts if we don't have a lifeline tapped in to God? If we choose not to walk closely with Him, we are not going to make it. Along this discipleship journey, along trying to raise someone else up, we're going to need God to pour into us as well. We're going to only be able to pour out what He has first poured in. We're going to have to remain close to God. I'm the vine, you are the branches. There's promises if we remain in God. You know, I was, um, I was, uh, I was talking to uh, one of my uh, mentors, and, uh, and he said, uh, I like spending. So, uh, so basically, huh, um, in, tr in, in times of difficulty in my life, I have found uh, uh, really, really deep places of intimacy, greater than times of uh, joy. It has been the, the tragedies, the difficulties, the pains of other people or even of my own doing that I have known the depths of God in a way I didn't understand on the mountaintop. 
there are lessons that a valley teaches you that, that a mountaintop just, just, just does it. Right? So, um, you know, for me in, in my life, it, you know, in this season, you know, it's pretty mountaintop-esque. Got all of y'all, got my girl, got my kids, I'm all right. I'm doing it this weekend, every hour, I'm okay. Y'all okay too? Okay, y'all look like me, I shouldn't be all right. I said, I can't be in a mountaintop. Okay, I didn't know how the saints felt about that. I didn't know it got strange in the atmosphere. Okay, anyway, I'm okay. Uh, so, you know, things are going all right for me. Okay, we got a little issues, got difficult struggles with things we believe in, in faith for, as everybody else does. But as a general consensus, I'm all right. And so I was talking to uh, uh, my mentor about this, and, and 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 I said, and I said, it makes me a little nervous. To be honest with you. Stuff's going well. I don't know. I don't know. Because I can, I, listen, I can feel the discipline weighing in my soul. He don't, be, he don't be feeling as close as he felt when I was in that dark. He doesn't, he doesn't, he don't feel as intimate. I'm telling y'all, fam, when your life hits a valley, you praying every day, we fasted, right? We got the Bible streaking, you version, right? We like, we are do. I got my morning, my first five. I'm reflective, like, okay, me and God be like this. But in seasons of of of, of success, me and God kind of we don't be as close. I I I I know an intimacy with God that a sermon can't get to, that a song can't get to. I've been comforted by God in, 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 in deep ways. And sometimes when things are going well, I'm, I miss that part. I miss that intimate, that intimate spot. So I'm expressing this concern to my mentor. I can tell you, what's the pastor Jeff? If you don't know him, great. <laughs> He's mine. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, so I'm talking to him about all this, and I, and I, and I, uh, and, 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 uh, I said, you know, I I, I, I I miss the depth of the fellowship. He's talking. I miss I miss how close it was when everything in my life burned to the ground. And I'd like to not have everything in my life burned down to the ground to experience that again. Can everybody say amen? I mean, God, if we can take the intimacy from the valley with me to the mountaintop, I would appreciate that. You know what he told me? He said, AJ, he said, uh, what you experienced in God wasn't meant to be a safe room. He said a safe room is where you run when there's some sort of danger in the house. He said the intimacy that you experienced with God in the valley was not meant to be a place that you run when something's going wrong. God didn't build for you in your relationship with him a safe room. He built for you a new house. He said this type of intimacy isn't where you run when something goes wrong. It's a new place where you live all the time. And I realized, oh, the disciplines expressed in times of difficulty were meant to be the new place in which I live in intimacy. Proximity to God. Is necessary. Not just as a response to trauma or to tragedy or to difficulty. Proximity to God is necessary as a new way of living. This is what happens when we get close to God. I've read it multiple times. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, it says this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Then 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from Yes, we're being, yes, we're close, and, and yes, we get rest. And then in that closeness, this is what we're supposed to do. Learn from Him. Learn from Him. Look at, what, look at the characteristics of the teacher we have. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is evil. And 
we, in order for us to disciple people, we can't disciple out of our own ideas, out of our own soul, out of our own experiences. Because listen, if we do it that way, we're only going to be able to take those up, those, those that, that God's called us to disciple, we're only going to take those up to the limit of our own experience. The way that the way that people can disciple me that may, maybe have never been to where I've been or, 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 or experienced what I've experienced is because they're not they're not discipling me from their soulish place. They're not discipling me from their own experience. They're, they're discipling me from the intimacy that they have with Satan, who can answer any question I ask. Are we in the room, fam? It's going to require proximity to God. But then it's also going to require proximity to others. To others. In order for uh, Samuel to be able to uh, uh, ask Eli what was going on, Eli had to do what? Be there. He had to be close enough to know what was going on in Samuel's life. Not only did Eli have to be close to God, Eli had to be close to each other. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me say something. One of the, one of the hardest things uh, as a pastor is, is when you have a people that don't want to be known by each other. That are, that are coming in to, to run back out. That are, that are trying to, I don't want to, I don't know, I don't want to talk to nobody, I don't want to get to be known, I don't want to. I don't know. About, about, about them small group. This is a victory group thing that typically goes talk about. What do you want? You know, I should, you know, church, well, all they want to do is be in your business. That's okay. Oh, we ain't nobody, nobody want to moan about that one. Okay, praise God. I told y'all, don't cry. I'm not scared of nobody in here, okay? Right? Oh, I don't, oh, I don't know about, I don't know if I want to, this, this ministry fair, I might have to introduce myself. They want me to go up there and say my name to somebody? Some of us don't even want, look, some, some of y'all don't even want to scan the QR code. I say, don't give an email, nothing. I just, not. Nah, don't trust it. Y'all know how we be treating church like telemarketers. That's okay. You can't laugh, say ouch. That's all right. I'll take either or. Some of us have so many walls up from being known. But some of the ways that you'll grow in God is by being known. Not just your name, your difficulties, your struggles, your issues, your problems. Because guess what? The people that God has placed around you may be the very people to help you hear Him with and respond to Him. Fam, now I don't have people in my business. Have you ever? I'm talking about people just know, know. I mean, just know the parts that you just rather them not. <laughs> like, I would just rather you not know that. And they know the things. And by them knowing the things, it has kept me whole. It has helped me. To have people and community in my life that can help me hear when God's called me. That can help me know when I'm getting off track. I talked about those valley seasons, fam. There's sometimes that you're experiencing so many so much pain in this world that you need an outside voice to help you navigate what you're walking through. You just out here dazed. I'm just like, I don't even know how I'm gonna make it through this thing. Some of us need, need to trust God with allowing people to be close to Him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to let people in. And I'm not, I'm not talking. You know, you know. Sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll hide behind our, our personality. This isn't an extrovert, introvert thing. I've been, that's not what I'm talking about. Here. I'm talking about heaven's design for you not to be. Alone. For you not 
to do this life by yourself. Well, AJ, uh, uh, well, uh, well I, 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 have, I have friends, and I'm open, and I, I'm honest. Well, then you, you create proximity for someone else. Then. Okay, well, uh, you know, I'm good, and I'm, I, I, I'm processing life in a, in a deep way. Okay, well, go help create an atmosphere for somebody else to process life in a deep way. One of the tables out there will be a victory completer. You may sign up today. Plug. <laughs> What we're, what we're trying to do, we're not trying to create some sort of, some sort of event space. We're trying to create a community of believers that are known. Peter would say in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. He illustrated this for us, that as he is connected to God, he still remain connected with others. Who are you walking closely enough with that can model your walk with God off of your walk? It's it's going to take this word that all of us all of us hate intentionality. We're going to have to be intentional. We're gonna, you know, in my house, um, if you don't hit the calendar, it's not going to happen. Anybody else run like that? Just like. If it's not, if it's not on the count, like we can have paper, and if it don't make it to Google Calendar, it just it's like a fan, it's like it didn't exist, right? Like like what? I don't even what? Who am I, right? Here's the thing: what has made it to your priority list? What have you given that much attention to? What are you being intentional? Like, where are you intentional with the space for community with God and community with each other? Are we there? Proximity. Proximity. Oh, thanks. All right. Last thing um, is perspective. 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 If we're going to be a church that disciples people and newfound victory and reconciliation with grace and without judgment, we're going to have perspective. I'll, I'll wrap this one up pretty quickly. So I've already come from the scene. But we have to have God's perspective of their development, not our perspective. And for that, let's let's jump to Genesis with the creation narrative. It's pretty famous. I'll read this is your Sunday school Bible reading today, okay? Creation story says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse of the sun. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was uh, evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered, to, gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout uh, vegetation, plant yield, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing uh, fruit in which, the, in, the, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth the vegetation of plants yielding uh, seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be light in the expanse of the heavens and separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the great light to rule the day and the lesser light, to rule, lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light and from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. 
and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great great sea creatures and every living creature that moves uh, with which the water swarms according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was... And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth livestock, uh, living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth, the earth according to their kinds, and livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was give the picture. After each segment of creation, God would look back at what he created and he would call it what? Good. He would call it good. What I want us to keep in mind as we're discipling people is this. A whole bunch of double negatives to follow this, this sentence. Not done doesn't mean not not done doesn't mean not good at each phase and stage of creation God was able to look back at the development to that point and say Can we, as a people that are that are discipling people, and develop, developing them, do we have enough in us that that says, I know they're on their journey, but where they've got to this point? That's good. That's good. When God was creating. But well, he separates the waters. He puts the sky in place and the lights, the stars. That, that was all he planned to create for that day. That was, that was all he was planning to do, was create that. So can we, can we as a people look at all that God had planned to do and the lives of the people that were discipling? And find the goodness there. I remember seasons of of, of, of my life um, being shipwrecked and and and, and people uh, coming to me and saying, "Hey, there you are. It's difficult. I'm proud." Of you. But in my mind. My life's not good until it's done. How can, how can you be proud of incomplete aging? How can you be proud of day four aging? How can you be, how can you call something that's good, or how can you call something that's not done, good? Family, I believe that's what God is calling us to do this to look at the progress where he has made in someone's life and help them realize it's good. I know you're not where you want to be. I'm not saying it's I'm not saying it's done, but I am saying this. Where you are right now, you're fine. It's a level of struggle it took you. To get to where you are, oh, I, I, I've come in here and and and, and, I, and I and I and I've done this thing and I, and I feel like a failure. If you made it into church this morning, we celebrate the progress in your life. You're good, AJ. You don't know 
Uh, my money's falling apart. You're good. Oh, AJ, you don't know my marriage is falling apart. You're good. Oh, AJ, you don't know I, 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 I'm I still having this struggle. I'm still having this. What he made, when he made you, it's good. It is. You are in the valley of decisions with the people that you're deciding. Search for the Search for the part in their story that God is right, that God is doing. Find the good and declare it good, even though it's not done. It's the first for seven. Not done doesn't mean not good. In the second respect, of course, is what? Good doesn't mean done. There's no test. We will be discovering God. Oh, God. Let me tell you something. There is no finish line on this earth. Though I'm in a season where it feels good, don't mean I'm done. That the pastor you have today in two years, in five years, in ten years down the road, it's going to be better. Because though I'm good, God's going to take me from glory to glory to glory to glory. I can't stop growing. I can't stop. I can't. If, all, if, you, if I've reached the point, if I've reached the pinnacle at 36 years, this is a boring life. But I know. That in my goodness, there's more good to experience. There's more grace to experience. There's more power to experience. There's more change to happen. There's more sanctification to happen. There's more wholeness to happen. Just because you're good doesn't mean you're done. And the same God that was faithful to create what he created in you on day four is the same God that will push you to day five. He's the same God that will push you to day six. He's the same God that will complete his work in you. Keep going. Keep stepping. Keep walking. And that God will perform his work. Philippians 1, 6 declares that he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm confident in this reality. I've seen it in my own life. God will finish what he started. Family, I have a deep desire for us to get this part right. So many churches mess it up just simply trying to walk with people. But I promise you, this is a formula for heaven, for this house. So we decide for people. We can operate in patience. We can operate in proximity. We have the proper perspective. And there'll be hope in God. What a privilege. What an honor. What an undeserved honor to be used by God in the life of someone else. But I promise you, it's our portion. Forgive me. Are we in the room today, fam? All right, all the stands on our feet. Come on, can we just praise God now, fam? Even for this word that He's spoken to us. I said, let's praise God even now for this word that God is speaking to us. I'm going to ask our, our, our leadership team to come. Get a place to minister. Family, in this moment, perhaps, uh, perhaps, perhaps these seasons pass. 
the journey that you're taking with Jesus has been pushed and brushed, maybe not appreciated, maybe not seen. Perhaps the walk that you've had with God hasn't been properly paced. You're feeling behind the pace of God. You're feeling behind the curveball. I want to encourage you today as you worship to receive prayer. That if, that if you recognize it, you know what? I need that step-by-step -step pace. I need that, that moment-by-moment pace. I need, I need the Lord to do something in my life. That's, that's beyond, it's beyond my own effort, my own strength. I want to encourage you to come and receive prayer from our team. We have prayed for you today. But before you can get on this step-by-step -step experience with God, you've got to start something. I want to be clear about this journey. The gospel is the good news. That Christ, that God became man in Jesus Christ. He lived the life that we should have lived, that of perfection, without sin. He died the death that we should have died, that of a sin. Scripture teaches us that they killed him on a cross for our sin, that he was buried in the grave. And then three days later, something insane happened. This Savior got up from the grave, defeating for us our final enemy, death, hell, and the grave, and proving that he is the Son of God just like he said he was. And here's what he did. He then offered the gift of salvation for everyone who believes that truth. And family, that gift is how we start the journey. That gift, accepting that beautiful thing, not by changing yourself, not by trying to figure yourself out. No, it's God that brings you from glory to glory. It's God that brings you from grace to grace. No, He sought you. He wants you. It's not that you want Him. In your messed up state, He wants you. In your dirty state, He wants you. In your, in your confused state, He is pursuing you. That God is who we want to introduce you to. And so family, for either call, if you'd like to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, or if you need prayer along this journey, I want to encourage you to come. I want us to sing together, family. Let's worship God corporately. And as you need prayer, please come and receive it this time. Let's worship God. You alone the highest praise and for you alone, I will be God, the highest praise, and all my love you alone, I will be God.
Father, I thank you, Lord, for your people experiencing your power, experiencing your freedom. Lord, I ask that you would continue to move in this place, Lord, that you would go beyond these words spoken, Father, and you would implant something in their heart that changes them, transforms them, and draws them closer to you. Lord, I pray your power, your blessing over your people as they go. Be with them. Be near. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Family, if you need prayer, our team will be up here after service. If not, you're dismissed to the ministry fair. <laughs> uh, go enjoy lunch together with the family. We'll start about 15 minutes upstairs. Love you guys.